Hey, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. Today's story goes back to yesterday and this morning when I was at hard at work proofreading a database of all of the identified portraits of Civil War soldiers and other participants who have appeared in the magazine since 1979. That's 44 years worth of images that we've published. The list is ongoing. We're still compiling it, but it's in the thousands at this point. And the database has a number of different classifications and categories, including soldiers and civilians. And so last night when I came upon the image of Katie Brownell, I thought, which category does she go in? Is she a soldier? Is she a civilian? Those of you who know her story remember that or may recall that she followed her husband, Robert, into the first Rhode Island Infantry in 1861, just after the Civil War began, and went on to some fame and notoriety after the war. She posed for a number of portraits of her with a rifle, uh, wearing her pseudo-military costume like the one that you see here, and uh, is quite well known to students of the Civil War. But the question remains, was she a soldier? Was she a civilian? Was she something else? And I had to find out so I could classify her in our database. So this morning, I did a bit of digging and found some interesting details. The first interesting detail I want to share comes from the book Women of the War. It was written by Frank Moore in 1867. It's a great reference book. I've used it on numerous occasions for nurses, vivandiers, and other participants, other women who were in the war in some way, shape, or another. And of course, they have a chapter on her because even during the war, she was quite well known. And this 1867 book is a favorite of mine because it has that primary source information that is written when the war is still fresh and the memories are still fresh in the minds of those who were involved or in some way covered it. So I want to get to this little description of her, which I think gives you a flavor of where she was and her designation. So here we go. Quote, when the regiment went into camp in Maryland early in the summer of 1861, this daughter of the regiment, and I'm going to pause there because daughter of the regiment is a popular, it was a popular role for women, especially young women in Union regiments early in the war. So here she's being classified as a daughter of the regiment. I'll continue. This daughter of the regiment was resolved not to be a mere water carrier, nor an ornamental appendage. She would be effective against the enemy, as well as a graceful figure on parade, and applied herself to learn all the arts and accomplishments of the soldier. When the company went out to practice daily at the target, she carried her rifle as well as the colors, and when her turn came, the men seldom restricted her to the three shots which were allowed to each. So pleased were they by her skill and coolness with the weapon that she was allowed as many shots as she chose and thus became one of the quickest and most accurate marksmen in the regiment. Nor was the sergeant's straight sword, which hung at her belt, worn as an idle form. She practiced daily with her husband and his friends in camp till she felt herself as familiar with the uses as with the carbine. When the regiment moved, she sought no indulgences on account of her sex, but marched in line beside her husband, wearing her sword and carrying the flag. So that's a great place to pause right now because you get a sense that although she joined her husband in the regiment, there is no evidence that she formally mustered. I'm sure if she did, it would have been said, it would have been known, it would have been messaged in this particular passage. There's no mention of it. So she sort of attached herself and proved 
perhaps most importantly, she proved that she was the equal of the men who formally enrolled and mustered into the regiment. So that's early summer. I want to take you to the next passage. We're now in the middle of July, and the regiment when other regiments in the Union Army are moving out of the defenses of Washington, D.C., and eventually to the battle at Manassas, known in the north as the Battle of Bull Run, the first Battle of Bull Run in late July of 1861. So here's the next passage from Woman of the War by Frank Moore. Quote, the middle of July came and the Union Army was at length moving southward from the Potomac, its face set towards Richmond. She, Katie, marched with her company and carried her flag. On the day of the general action, this is a reference to the first Battle of Bull Run, she was separated from her husband, the carbiners, another word with skirmishers, the carbiners with whom she was connected being deployed as skirmishers in the skirt of pine woods on the left of the line. About one o'clock, on that eventful day, the company was brought under fire. She did not carry her carbine that day, which means she didn't have her gun, but acted simply as color bearer. The men, according to skirmish tactics, were taken out by fours and advanced towards the enemy. She remained in the line, guarding the colors, and thus giving a definite point on which the men could rally as the skirmish deepened into a general engagement. There she stood, unmoved and dauntless, under the withering heat and amid the roar and blood and dust of that terrible July day. I'll pause again. Here we have Katie Brownell. She's with the soldiers, with the skirmishers. As the battle develops, she is not carrying her gun. She is carrying the flag. And as many of you know, if you're students of the Civil War, the flag bearers were essential uh, throughout the war because they, they provided a rallying point. They served a point where folks could actually move and direct their actions. And she's in the middle of all this. And if that's not the definition of a soldier, I really don't know what is. So here she is in the middle of all this battle. The battle is unfolding. And of course, the, the day does not go in favor of Union forces. Eventually, the Confederates take control of the battlefield and famously force the great skedaddle of the Union Army back to the safety, the defenses of Washington, D.C. And of course, Katie, like the other Rhode Islanders and other members of the Union Army that day, get caught up in this pell-mell rush to get back to Washington, and she's moving back with the retreating Union forces. There's a little passage that I want to give to you here, which gives you another sense of her continued participation during the rout of Union forces. Here's the passage. Quote, just then a soldier in a Pennsylvania regiment who was running past seized her by the hand and said, come sis, there is no use to stay here just to be killed. Let's get into the woods. She started down a slope with him towards a pine thicket. They had run hardly 20 steps when a cannonball struck him full on the head and in an instant he was sinking beside her, a shapeless and mutilated corpse. His shattered skull rested a moment on her shoulder and streams of blood ran over her uniform. I want to share that passage with you, not because it was gruesome, but because it gives you a sense that she actually was in the battle. She was caught up in the retreating forces. And there's no question, if that passage is true, that she was under fire. She was under fire when she was with the skirmishers and during the retreat. And here is a, an eyewitness firsthand account of her being almost struck by a cannonball. So armed with this information, I then went to fold3.com, which is owned by Ancestry. It is the military specialty database, which includes National Archives, military service records, and pension files. Now, I searched for her military service record, and I did not find any mention of it. 
which strengthened my understanding that she never formally mustered as a soldier. She simply became a soldier because of the recognition of the men in the ranks of the 1st Rhode Island Infantry. But I did find a very curious entry that led me to understand why she is considered a soldier, and it is the document that is here. This is her pension record, or I should say, this is the index card that says that she received a pension. Now, her actual pension file is not on fold3.com, but the original is in the National Archives. But this record here proves that she received a pension. And you can see it has all the standard uh, fields filled in. It tells you that she had a late rank. And look at that late rank, D of R. That means daughter of the regiment uh, and the color bearer with the Rhode Island volunteers. You see the date that it was issued. You see the number of the application and the fact that the application was granted. And at the bottom, it has her 1915 death date. So there it is. It's proof that she received a pension. Now, I want to put a little bit of a footnote on this because other women received pensions. They were nurses during the Civil War who came through official channels. So they received pensions towards the later part of the 19th century. But I have never seen a, an, an instance of a woman who was daughter of the regiment receiving a pension. So that's unusual. And so if you ask me, in my humble opinion, I would say that Katie Brownell was indeed a Civil War soldier. So there you have it. Thanks for joining me on the trail, and we'll see you next time. Take care.